it's an honor to be here. And um, so just, uh, just a few more people are coming in. Uh, well, I am indeed a yoga teacher, and one of the things I maybe I should just kind of preset here is the idea that I won't be teaching any postures. And, um, you know, the truth is that uh, yoga these days has become synonymous. Uh, it is more popular than ever, and uh, we are doing it in great numbers in the United States. Something like the, the, the statistic that's often used is, is cited is about 18 million Americans are doing yoga. But the truth is that America has tapped into just a tiny fraction of the potential of yoga. And in fact, most of us really think of it as exercise. And uh, I can begin by telling you that really the scope of yoga is, has a lot more to do with life itself than just exercise. I'd like to just, before I get into the material, try and create some context. Uh, and particularly in uh, this extraordinary event that's happening uh, where world leaders and influential thinkers are all kind of congregating and together uh, pooling their ideas and their inspirations and their passions. And um, when I looked at my description last night in preparation for this morning, I thought to myself, in light of so much of what's going on in this particular event, it seems like a rather small idea, the idea of seeking happiness and in a way maybe even selfish or self-centered, given the kind of broad scope and context of this event. And I will, I hope, create, a, create an understanding in you or help us all understand that they are in fact not in conflict. In fact, they are um, a parallel tracks. The yoga itself comes from the Vedic tradition. And the Vedas are what we could really say are the oldest existent spiritual scriptures on the planet. And they have some profound ideas in them that we actually see have matriculated and evolved into various religious and spiritual traditions throughout the world. One of the principal ideas, and this is probably the basis of my saying that your individual happiness if it is, is long-term, if it is sustainable happiness, is in fact consistent with global, let's put it this way, the, the globe itself and all the various populations, all the various sites we can think of on the globe thriving. Those are two consistent ideas. What the tradition says is this, is that when you are thriving, when you are serving your highest purpose, you are in fact serving the highest purpose of everything. The way I like to portray that is that each of us is a note in the symphony of existence, in the symphony of creation. And the Vedic tradition then begins to build on this idea that says that if you are thriving, you are in fact serving the greater good. Now what does thriving look like? There's a difference between, we can say, happiness and thriving. Thriving from the Vedic tradition has this idea that the soul, each of us, inherently has four desires. And I'm going to define them in a moment. What I'll say is these four desires, if we pay attention to them, if we honor all four, it begins to make possible that we reach our potential as human beings. Human beings, um, as evidenced by this event and so much in your life, are unique, are unique in the entire, on the enti as far as existence is concerned, as far as the world is concerned, we are unique. Our potential is really limitless. Architecture, engineering, science, art, dance, music, communications, politics, the development of civilization, uh, literature, media, technology, Human beings are the one species capable of that kind of scope of development. And these four desires touch upon us extending the potential that is, that is seated in each individual. So what does it look like? Here are these four desires. I'll go through them fairly quickly so I can kind of then begin to build on that theme. The first and foremost of these four desires is what in the Vedic tradition is called dharma. Dharma means, uh, well, has a lot of meanings. One of the meanings of the word is path or law or virtue. 
The gist of it is that each of us has a unique purpose. That each of us has a unique reason for being. If you go back into this science, and we, I can, we can really make the case that the Vedas are a science rather than a religion, we can say that their view of this is that each of us was really born out of a noble idea. That each of us has something noble and significant to contribute to the world. And that can happen through parenting, it can happen through government, it can ha politics, it can happen through creativity and art. And one of the things I try and remind people of is it's not necessarily saying your purpose is found through a specific career. It is found through a unique, let's say, quality of contribution. So if I could, in your mind, just conjure up a few individuals. We can conjure up Leonardo da Vinci, conjure up Mother Teresa. Think of um, Buckminster Fuller. Think of Nelson Mandela. Each of them had something unique to contribute. And we really couldn't ask any one of them to fill the shoes of any one of the other three. Each of us has that potential. This is the promise and the, let's say, kind of the, where they set the bar in Vedic tradition, which is, says that each of us, if we are going to be happy, need to fulfill that purpose. So it begins by finding it, of course, and I'll speak to how we do that before we're done. But the first and foremost thing that we need to pay attention to, according to this tradition, is what are we here to do? What are we here to accomplish? What am I here to contribute? How can I elevate not just my own experience of life, but how do I elevate others? And it's very simple. If we really wanted to create happiness in a nutshell, we have that teaching to draw from. It says... If you're going to be happy, honor that purpose. If you do honor that purpose, you will be happy. If you don't honor that purpose, you won't. It's a kind of bold statement. It means that we can have many things. We can, uh, in fact, accomplish a great deal of things. We can have material uh, success, material prosperity. But without alignment with that purpose, we won't actually be deeply satisfied. So that's the, I would say, that's the preeminent of the four. We begin with that idea. The next three, in a sense, are in service of that one. The next one becomes arta, which means to have the means to fulfill that purpose. So typically, this would refer to financial means, physical health, uh, having a roof over your head. But more than that, it's also the specific tools and means you utilize in order to fulfill your purpose. If, my, if today is consistent with my purpose, this microphone is helping me. This is actually a means to help me fulfill my purpose of communicating these ideas with you. So we look to our life and see what things we can, what things are meaningful to us, what things are necessary for us to fulfill our purpose. And um, not all of us have to be multimillionaires to fulfill our purpose. If you are, in fact, um, a yoga teacher, your means will be different than, in fact, if you are a world leader. Necessarily, they may be, in fact, different. If you're a real estate developer, you'll have different means than an artisan. So the main thing I want to say here is that this idea, ultimately, of fulfillment and physical or monetary or material means, they're not conflicting ideas. And that's a little radical because a lot of people think that to be successful in yoga, you have to have nothing. And only when you have nothing and you've renounced everything, you've renounced the world and all it's, I'm already, you know, I'm dressed in a linen shirt. That's already a little non-yogic in a way. But uh, the point being that this is really a kind of new idea that you have to renounce the world in order to actually fulfill your purpose and your spiritual destiny. So as I'm looking around the room today, my sense is a lot of you can take comfort that you can have both a sense of fulfillment and worldly prosperity. The third desire is uh, enjoyment. It's actually the word is kama, and it means uh, enjoyment or pleasure. And very often, I guess, if you were orthodox in one religion or another, you might be hesitant to indulge pleasure. And I think that's rightfully said. Rightfully, we should respect the fact that 
Probably you and I have experienced this at various times in our life, that we seek certain pleasures that are not constructive, they're not supportive. But I want to step back and just remind you that all of these, all of the desires are, should be in service of our greater purpose. In addition to the pleasure of uh, beauty and art and sensuality and good company, even sexuality, um, I talk to people, and some people it's gardening. In fact, I was gardening last night and that, with my three of my kids, and that was great pleasure. So it's to also say that our life can be, in fact, quite rich with pleasure. But beyond that, there's also one more element to pleasure, which is really quite significant, and that is the pleasure of accomplishment. It's said in the Vedas that a human being will brave the roughest seas in order to experience the pleasure of accomplishment. That's what you and I do. In fact, very often, the rougher the seas, the more pleasure we derive from when we get to the other side, when we get to our destination. So we should also think as pleasure as being part of this larger purpose in life. And the final one is perhaps the one that most people attribute to yoga and think that yoga predominates, or it's the predominant theme in yoga, and that is, um, we'll call it spiritual freedom or liberation. The Sanskrit word for it is moksha. And moksha, in fact, is often, again, misinterpreted to mean that somehow or another you want to renounce everything, dissolve all, all, all connections to the world, to family, to finances, to every responsibility, and somehow dissolve into heaven. And that's really not quite the right idea. The right idea, or the way it's really portrayed in the ancient wisdom, is the idea that if we could have these three desires that I've already described, and at the same time have freedom while we pursued them, that would lead to the greatest quality of life. It's, you know, have you ever, has the alarm ever gone off for anyone in this room and you thought, oh, do I really have to get out of bed right now? Has anyone had that feeling ever? <laughs> once, just once, maybe? All right, so at that moment, that instant where the alarm goes off and you have a certain level of dread or just sense of overwhelm on the responsibilities you have, that moment was a call, was a, was a call for freedom. It wasn't to not have the beauty and the joy and the purposefulness that you have in your life. It was, can I do it and yet be unburdened by it? That's really what we long for. So those four desires, let's just take a moment, just consider them for a moment. Purposeful life, having the means to fulfill it, some pleasure along the way, and freedom. Think about those four things. And th what I'd like you to do is to consider that the extent to which you are honoring all four desires, you are truly fulfilling your potential. That's it. In short, throughout my life, I lived in Los Angeles, and, I, and, as, and when Jean introduced me, she said, I've been teaching for 30 years, a little over, something like 32 years. And I used to teach in a part of Los Angeles that's not unlike Aspen. In fact, some of the, quite a few of the people I taught had planes that arrived on it to Aspen on a regular basis. And I really, as a young man, I was in my, uh, I was just turning 20 when I began teaching yoga. It's hard not to be impressed by the level of accomplishment and by the level of vision and creativity by those who are materially successful. It doesn't happen by itself. It requires passion, intensity, and a good deal of other qualities. At the same time, I, w I had the kind of privilege of being around individuals who had attained a high level of spiritual connection, or we'll say spiritual awareness, or self-understanding at the deepest levels. And very often I found that individuals who had one didn't have the other. That it was a kind of either or scenario. And what I'm arguing for is that the full life is a combination, an integration, a dance really, a weaving of those two worlds. And Really, I, the focus of my, the yoga that I teach is, in fact, I still teach a few postures. I still see, po teach postures. But the gist of it and the heart of it and the, the, really the subject of the book I've written called The Four Desires is about finding this ground where we can not just find uh, one of those desires, but how we, in fact, fulfill them all. 
It is the pivot around not just happiness, but it is the pivot around the feeling that really our life has meaning. In the, in the tradition, the, they speak about desire in a very interesting way. And now I'm stepping outside of orthodoxy, because most orthodox traditions, whether it's Christianity or Judaism or Buddhism, or go through the list. Desire is considered really kind of anathema to spiritual freedom, spiritual attainment, the richest, let's say, the most profound accomplishment one can have in one's life. Desire is considered the opposite. And when, I step, when you step outside the orthodoxy and you look at actually what Buddha said, he said he simply made a qualification, not good or bad. He said wholesome and unwholesome. That was the way he described desires. There are some that are going to support your well-being, and there's some that are not. In the Vedic tradition, uh, they say they use the term helpful and pleasurable. Some desires are, in fact, nothing more than more pleasure and maybe it doesn't even last. And then other desires are in fact helpful, helpful for your growth and helpful for its positive impact on the larger whole of which we are all a part. That's the central theme of this idea, that you and I essentially are operating within a universe in which we are not separate from. And I think that by this day and age, if I had said that 20 years ago, um, there still might be a pretty strong debate about whether or not we were connected to the larger universe. But you know what? You and I, at this stage of the game, understand that when our economy went bad, the first country that really suffered, do you remember when, what country that was? It was very up north, do you remember? Iceland? Iceland. Iceland's impacted by our economy tanking. Who would have thought? When Chernobyl, does, when Chernobyl went off, People in Finland were getting cancer. When, in fact, in uh, most major cities, the water is actually full of the pharmaceuticals that the people are taking. So, in fact, if you don't take pharmaceuticals, but you open your tap, you are. So, we're connected. We breathe the same air. The rain here is informed by what uh, uh, countries are doing halfway across the world. Um, in essence, to boil this down, what the tradition is saying is, how do you figure out your purpose? Out of the, all the possible purposes there are in the world, and I look at the list of speakers, for example, at this event, and I think, wow, I wish I had their purpose. That would be cool. That would be impressive to be in those shoes. How interesting their life might be. And uh, it's easy to begin to look outside of ourselves and think uh, of the... Of the uh, of the possibilities of being in someone else's um, place in life. The tradition is very clear about this. And some of you probably have heard of a book called the Bhagavad Gita, which is one of the most wonderful depictions of life from a spiritual perspective, but how we live it, how we live a spiritual life in the world. And one of the things it says, and I can quote it, I think, exactly, it says, it is better to live your purpose, to fulfill your duty badly, than to fulfill someone else's well. That's really what we're left with. So how does one decipher one's purpose? This is where yoga begins to come into play. Because in essence, in essence, the... Uh, uh, the key to finding that out is not found outside of you. It's found inside of you. The tradition makes it very clear that we don't, discuss, we don't uh, develop a purpose. I don't look at, for instance, Madeleine Albright's purpose and think, wow, that would, yeah, why don't I mirror hers? Or Warren Buffett's purpose. Why don't instead, what is necessary in order to understand my unique note in the symphony of creation is a still mind. Only through stillness, only entering into a kind of timelessness, a steadiness that is distinct or different from the society you live in, from the world events happening outside of you. Only when I can step into timelessness, devoid of external information, 
does that purpose begin to ring true? Does its clarion call come through clearly? So what it suggests then is that there is that taking time, if you will, to step outside of your rational mind, outside of the scope that your rational mind can reach, taking time away from it is one of the most helpful things you can do for yourself. It also so happens that meditation and re deep relaxation have the kind of physiological, the benefits of them, I, and, I, and I, I don't that this doesn't sound too crude, but if we could package the physiological benefits of deep relaxation or meditation and put it in a pill, it would outsell Viagra. I'm quite clear. First of all, there's no, there's no negative effects. In fact, when you relax deeply, if you have low blood pressure, it actually can elevate. And when you have high blood pressure, it lowers. It has this amazing effect on our physiology. But my point today is not so much a physiological call, you know, not so much appealing to the benefits of the physiology, but rather the sense of purposefulness and uh, uh, the, the, the very quality of the way we live. So before we're done today, I think, I, I, and I think we've, we've uh, mentioned in the description that we'll go ahead and do a short meditation. In short, my book, The, the Four Desires, in helping individuals try and find and shape the purpose and then build from that into even larger ideas around the four desires, uh, a critical piece of it is meditation. It suggests that, um, uh, that we have so much coming at us in terms of just raw sensorial information, just input that's constantly flowing toward us. Uh, that it becomes so hard to really hear this inner calling. And we also have the kind of um, multifaceted attractions of the mind. So the mind gets distracted. And has anyone um, used the internet ever and uh, uh, um, had this experience? Well, basically, you go online to um, just, you know, you just to, to sh check out, let's say, New York Times or Huffington Post. And, find out what the goings on are of the day. And before you're done, you've bought three sweaters. Has that ever happened to you? So you go there with one purpose, and then you get taken off to somewhere else. If we think about it, the mind is constantly being drawn from one thing to the next, from one thing to the next. In fact, one thing I'd like you to think about before, before I'm done, I'd like to emphasize this point. When you leave this short time that we have together. You will spend the rest of your life fulfilling or answering a single question. And the question is a simple one. It's very straightforward. But think about it. The question is, what's next? At this moment, you're answering the question. How will I sit? How will I breathe? Will I take notes? Will I not take notes? What will I do when I leave this room? I heard about meditation. I've heard about it before. Rod Stryker reintroduced me to the idea of its significance. Will I ever do it? Will I go to all, will I, how will I use my time here in Aspen at this you know, unique and extraordinary event? What is next is the critical question that we spend our life asking ourselves. And at the end of our life, our life is really a statement it's the accumulation. It's a logical progression of how we've answered that question, what's next? How will I respond to this next moment? How will I respond to this argument? How will I respond to these ideas? How will I respond to this aspect of the news? How will I respond to my disturbance? How will I respond to my conscience? These are all questions that we ask ourselves millions, millions of times. So, the question then becomes, if that's what we're asking all the time, how do I answer it in the best way possible? In the way that, by answering it consistently in a way that supports my well-being, that supports the greater good. And I have learned, if nothing else today, you've learned that if you support your highest well-being, you're supporting the global well-being. So now, how will I support my well-being? 
And again, my, what I encourage you to do is to seek out whatever form of it you want. Seek out some means by which you take a break, where you literally become, if you will, you forget or you disengage from worldly matters. And you may, I'm looking at a lot of people in this room, many of you who look like you have wonderful lives. But the value of stepping away from your wonderful life, just for a few minutes, on a regular basis, can transform it to become even more wonderful. And moreover, so that you ensure that you are responding to what is next, that central question, in the most effective, in the most meaningful way, that's really critical that we take that time. In meditation or in deep relaxation, and some relaxation, by the way, you can do on your back, but it's, you know, I would, there's actually a, a growing methodology that's kind of a growing development, which is called Yoga Nidra. Yoga Nidra is relaxed, if we could call it a, a quality of relaxation that's almost sleep, but sleep with awareness. That's the way we could define it. It's lately being tested in the, the military with uh, people coming back from the war and um, uh, suffering from uh, PTSD. It's being used you know, with addicts and to show changes in cognitive behavior. It's really quite an amazing tool. And uh, if you can get your hands on something related to Yoga Nidra taught by someone with some authority, you will be amazed. The beauty of it is you get to lie down and do nothing and just listen and essentially teach yourself to relax. So in that state of relaxation, what happens to each of us is that we don't, we're no longer of this time. We're no longer of the economic qualities of the time. In fact, we're not even of the time related to our individual age. How old am I? That disappears. If you relax enough, the aches and pains go away. In fact, it's a profound pain management system, and that's been well documented in the research. And beyond that, this is what taps us into that stream of inner knowingness, that inner voice. People who've studied yoga a little bit invariably come up with a kind of somewhat challenging question, which is, do you need a teacher? Because they've read something quite critical that I want to share with you, which is it says that there's a teacher within you. There's a voice of conscience. And now not conscience like morality, but conscience as one who knows more than you know. That exists within us. And that is uncovered when we relax. When the rational mind becomes quiet, this kind of inner knowingness, and many of have felt it, a gut feeling, a feeling of, have you ever had that feeling? Like, I know exactly what I need to do. It was a great sage in the seventh century said just that, he said. I always know what is right, but sometimes I don't do it. I always know what is wrong, but sometimes I do it. The key is that we, there is this vehicle, there's this, this presence of knowing that is within us. And that's what meditation is to help us with. In this conference, in these few days you're spending here, there will be tremendous intelligence and rational thinking put at your feet, and you, maybe some of you in the room will be part of the process, in fact. And just by being here, in fact, you are part of the process. But what I encourage you to do, when all is done, is that in addition to the great resources that we have for our intellect, that we take some time away from the intellect in order to tap into something of deep meaning that's timeless, and that if we begin to learn how to uncover it, will teach us or guide us to the life that deep in our heart all of us want. Okay, so I've made a pitch for meditation. Would you guys mind uh, with the remaining time that we have? We have about 10 minutes. Would that be okay if we uh, guide you through some of it? Maybe you were just waiting all this time. You weren't expecting a whole speech, and you only came for the meditation. So I'll just take a quick sip, and while I'm doing that, just put down your notes and have your feet flat on the floor, please. I would suggest that you put your lower back right against the very back of your chair uh, so that you are comfortable and ideally your spine is as vertical as possible. Okay. 
Let me just front load this by saying it's perfectly fine if your mind wanders. In fact, if you, are, if you find that you get distracted during this practice, all I would do is welcome you to the club because everyone has felt the same thing, has experienced the mind being distracted. But there are some ways to get the mind quiet. The yogis found some interesting methods and interesting areas within their body that allow us or help us to get the mind quiet. So let's just go ahead and sit tall. I'll just go ahead and begin to lead you through this practice. And I'll ask you to close your eyes. Your breath is key to helping the body and the mind relax. So what I'll ask you to do is just in your own way, begin to smoothly increase the inhale and the exhale. And as you're breathing through your nostrils, slowly sense the breath, not just moving through the nostrils, but there's a sense of the breath moving everywhere into the body. As though your body was an empty vessel, sense the breath moving toward your hands, moving toward your feet. And as you exhale, just feel as though the vessel is being emptied. Just please continue again. Just if you get distracted, just put your attention on the breath. Without straining, you're doing your best to move toward a complete inhale and a complete exhale. What I'll do is I'll encourage you to feel that as your breath becomes more smooth, your mind is becoming more quiet. Continue just for about another minute and have the sense that you are sending a signal to the mind and to the body to relax. Excellent. Now slowly allow your breath to become involuntary. And as the breath now begins to flow on its own without you shaping it, see the breath rising and falling through your nostrils. Just see the breath rising and falling as two separate streams, ascending and descending through the left and right. sense that the apex of that movement is the point between your eyebrows. So more or less, the stream of the breath is forming like an upside down V. The two lines of the breath intersecting between the eyebrows. Just for another minute or so, watch the breath move and remain effortless.
Just feel that very gentle sensation and sense the two lines of the breath meeting between the eyebrows. What some of you might begin to feel is though the sensation or the awareness between your eyebrows starts to grow or expand. In addition to being mindful of the breath, there's a kind of presence or even light between your eyebrows that's starting to grow. Science has helped to confirm the ancient wisdom that, in fact, there are many parts of the brain that we don't use, particularly the frontal cortex, where we use only a fraction of its potential. Feel now as though a kind of presence or light is starting to grow or expand in that space. On the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus said, let thine two eyes become one, and thy body shall be full of light. It's exact corollary to the yogic teaching. Now, as you relax in that space, you can relax your awareness of the breath. Feel as though your forehead is transparent, translucent, if you will. Without trying to visualize anything, without trying at all, sense that light or energy or presence or awareness starts to flood through the brain, through the forehead, into the brain. For a few minutes, I'm going to ask you to sit quietly and feel light, presence, energy, healing. Move through your forehead, skull. And soak the brain, envelop the brain. Feel the brain soaking in a bath of light or presence. As you give yourself over to this awareness, feel the senses being recharged. Your eyes, sense of smell, sense of hearing, sensation. Feel it completely beginning to renew and re-energize and recharge you. the brain soaking in light or energy. Just a few more moments. Feel the brain soaking, the senses recharged, your whole being renewed and re-energized.
Now the last step, resting in this kind of presence, quality of being. Please think of something important to you, something that you would like to accomplish that would serve not just your individual good, but the larger good. Something you want to become, some aspect of life you would like to include that you've been ignoring, or some aspect of life you would like to step away from that you've deemed unconstructive. In your own way, first identify what that might be, some really meaningful intention you would like to fulfill. And now, I'm going to ask you to either see it in that light or presence in your brain, or say the words like you are stating an affirmation, what it is you want to accomplish. And as you see it or say it, feel with absolute certainty that it'll be fulfilled. Say it three times. With absolute certainty, it'll be fulfilled. And then just take a moment, feeling it as completely viable, completely certain, to give thanks. As though you now will end the practice with just the, the kind of the thankfulness that it's already happened. Rest in that knowledge, in that certainty, in that confidence. And then slowly lower your chin and create a little bit of heat in your hands if you want. It's a nice way to come back. Just rub your palms briskly together and put that over your eyes. Okay. Excellent. So welcome back. Does it feel okay? Feel all right? Okay, I think I have question at time. I don't know. My time monitor was doing the meditation and she stopped flashing things at me. So I don't know if I'm out of time or. Okay. I'm so glad you did it though. You deserve it. All right, so we have about four or five minutes. Uh, any questions at all with any part of, um, of that description? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I don't know if we have a mic. Thank you. Thank you for that meditation. That was sure. wonderful. Sure. My question is, is there's some thought about, you know, in America in particular, do something, achieve something, then be happy. Mm -hmm. And then there's religions that talk about be happy first, mm -hmm. get in that place, and then you can do or accomplish. So can you speak to, because you kind of talked about purpose. Yep. And, and I hear sometimes be happy, then you can maybe find your purpose. But mm -hmm. it's a possibility to be happy first and focus on that. That is a wonderful question. So was everyone able to hear the question? Because it's probably a critical piece of my talk that I didn't include. And I'm so glad you brought it up. So the question has to do with, should we focus on attaining and fulfilling certain, like an end game, and by which we'll be happy? And you attributed that to kind of an American. You know, it's pretty global now, though. They're doing that in China, too. Um, uh, and or should we, like more of the spiritual traditions suggest, find the happiness and then let it flow forward? Well, they're not mutually exclusive, once again. From the tradition, your soul actually has two parts. Again, this is the Vedic tradition, so I can't speak for every spiritual tradition, but the, the one from which I'm uh, um, deriving these teachings, and it says that your nature is already fulfilled. You are already fulfilled. And what we'd have to do is recognize it. We have to clear away the distractions and the obstructions to clear seeing. And then this wealth or this, we'll call it this spark of eternity, this spark of spirituality will always be there. It's in us. So that's what meditation and the like is for. And that is what I would suggest is one of the tracks of two parallel tracks. The other, the other teaching is that our soul has a purpose, that the drive, as I said earlier, that 
It's not that the soul is incomplete. It actually wants to share its own love of self, its own sense of glorifying its, its capacities is found in the accomplishments of the world. And so they're not actually mutually exclusive. They should actually be occurring uh, 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 simultaneously. And that's where meditation, relaxation comes in. That's to recognize that we are already fulfilled, that we need to clear away the obstacles to clear seeing so we can remember that. And then at the same time, not just sit around in that remembrance and not contribute anything to the world. And so what it suggests is, find that, find that, find what, you know, what that spark of eternity is that is you, and at the same time, honor it by giving its full voice because it actually is here for a reason. So it's the perfect question and maybe the best way to answer and uh, end the day. So, and perfect timing. So thank you all for coming. Thanks to the Aspen Ideas Festival. Have a wonderful conference. Thank you. Thank you.